I want to start with the word. You can turn to Acts 1. There should be Bibles underneath the seats uh, there in front of you or in front of some of them if you want. Uh, But I'm going to read along here. Acts 1, 1 to 14. And I'm reading from the NIV, so that should match uh, the books that are there. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the father has set by his own authority, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going. When suddenly... Two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying, Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers." The word of God for the people of God. Well, this is part of the same series Jimmy started last week. If you uh, missed uh, that, he gave a, a teaching where we looked at how Jesus is that thing that we need as a church to move forward. We looked at... Um, Nicodemus coming to Jesus and the idea of needing to be born again. We looked at the rich young ruler and having to sacrifice and make choices uh, to follow Jesus and how that can sometimes be difficult when things are going well in this world. Today we're moving a little bit further and we're looking at who are we as the early church and where better to look than to the first part for the early church. Acts 1 Here, Jesus has left. He's called the disciples to be the early church, and these are some of the final instructions that are recorded for them. So what, then, are we to be as a church? Who are we to be, and what are we to do together? Well, I was talking to Matt. Matt was up here playing the keyboard. He didn't know he was part of this sermon today, and neither did I. But... He was sharing with me. I said, you know, maybe he could preach uh, this morning. And he said, you know, I could probably give a sermon right now if I just had the microphone and a passage. And, uh, but if I had to do it next week and you told me today, I'd write 13 sermons before then. He would just think about it and think about it and think about it. And that is often the way. Uh, my past pastor uh, in Chatham, the, this guy I worked with, he had this big whiteboard in his office, massive. But in the corner, he had this little tiny note written with tiny Sharpie, don't forget the secret weapon. 
You see, writing a sermon is, is challenging. You know, I read first the passages and I pray to God about them and God reveals things about my own life that I need to deal with. Then I go back again and I ask God for more, but I ask specifically for us as a body. That's a lot. But I also meet with people throughout the week. We have coffees and lunches or phone calls and emails. I do readings and I look at commentaries. I study to see what the history of the passage meant. It all ends up in this big melting pot that God is stirring. Combined with my experiences, sometimes this other person that I met with would find by Thursday there isn't much of a sermon and Sunday is coming. And sometimes he'd be staring at that whiteboard, looking at all his notes and the ideas and the thoughts, and he'd be trying to rely on his own strength to do it, the skills that he had. I remember one time in his office, he replied much the same as Matt. I think now, if I had to, I could take a passage and just preach a sermon without any preparation whatsoever. We, ha we gain skills as we study. But that isn't what we're called to use, just to use our own skills. And sometimes, no matter how much good information you have, you don't have a good sermon yet until you go to the secret weapon. And what was that? The secret weapon was prayer. Nothing else was working. He needed to stop and pray. Well, you know, it, it's not that that's a big, crazy idea. I think we're often called to pray in all circumstances of life, but it's easy to forget. Without his little note, sometimes Saturday night, trying to prepare for the last little bits of his sermon, he would forget. Sometimes I forget that I need to pray as things aren't coming together, and I need to be reminded. We just read a passage here from Acts 1, and the disciples had forgotten an awful lot. You see, they had been following Jesus around for three years, and they had been disciples, disciples in the Hebrew way before Jesus. They knew a lot of the Hebrew scriptures, not good enough to become disciples of another leader at that time. We learn about Jesus calling people from every walk of life to speak and share. No, these disciples, they knew and had their Jewish upbringing from life. But now they've had three years where Jesus has told them, you've heard it said this way, but now I show you this way. You see, the Hebrews believed in faith that God was going to use them to bless the whole world. It's how their faith was, it's what their faith was centered on, and they believed that you needed to follow the laws in order for God to return and for that blessing to come. Well, Right after Jesus had died, the disciples lost faith. We can read about some of the disciples uh, in, in Luke going back home in Luke 24 on the road to Emmaus. It's easy to forget when life comes at you. It's easy to forget when you've learned a new way when you've brought up learning from one single school. The disciples... They've just encountered Jesus coming back from the dead. They witnessed his death. Think about it. Their teachers told them, my kingdom is coming, a new way, I'm going to lead you. They have all of this hope, and it's ripped away. But then what happens three days later? They witness the biggest miracle of all when Jesus is resurrected and walks and stands before them and continues to teach. I think we have to forgive them for forgetting. When Jesus came back from the dead, they went right back to what they'd learned their whole life. Israel is going to bless the whole world. How? Jesus is going to be the king. We're going to take over all these other countries that are doing bad things. We're going to teach them the proper way to do it. And through that, through that judgment and correction, we're going to bless the whole world. That's the way they've been brought up. It wasn't the way Jesus was teaching but it's what they were taught. It's what they remembered. It was what was ingrained inside of them. How do we forget? One way that I've forgotten is I get caught up in my own experience. 
I'll remember the ways that my grandparents taught me to pray when I was a child, the ways that I learned to pray with my parents when we were in church. But my prayer life has grown an awful lot since then. Sometimes we get too busy with life. I remember at the beginning of COVID working with a bunch of leaders and one of my most faithful and dedicated leaders, somebody that would lead our community every week, confessed, it's very hard for me to pray for 30 seconds with my children during a day. The stage of life that they had brought was so busy that they would forget to pray if it wasn't in their calendar. Sometimes in life, we run into situations where we're in trouble. And in those situations, we rely on our own strength. How can I get through this? How do I get to the other side? Well, how do we remember? The disciples were given an, a pair of angels, people that came to say, don't forget. Why do you stand here? What were you called to do? And how do we remember? We need to meet together in prayer. It says at the end of this passage that we read that the disciples went back to Jerusalem. They all went back into that room and they were together in prayer, remembering, remembering the things that Jesus had done, remembering the things that he had taught them. We can read about this in Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy chapter 11, uh, it talks a lot about uh, the history of the Israelites. Moses is telling the, the people how they must remember. They're going to be going into the land, but they're not going to remember because the children and their children's children will not have lived through the experience of gaining freedom from the bondage that they had in Egypt. So how will they remember how God, who God was and who they were called to be? They would have to remember together in prayer. Verse 19 says, teach them to your children, talking about them when you sit down at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Write them on your door frames of your houses and on your gates, so that your days and the days of your children may be many in the land the Lord swore to give your ancestors, as many as the days that the heavens are above the earth. We have to rely on others to help us remember those that have come before. We have to rely on those uh, that wrote it down so that we can follow, not just on our own understanding and our own time speaking to God. What does that look like in our home with our kids? It means that at mealtimes, we pray. At bedtime, we read stories about Jesus. But it also means that we pray during big transitions it means we participate in spaces like we have got going on downstairs, teaching our kids through KidMax, but also pulling in resources from others in our community to teach them more about who Jesus is. We remember by going to home church. Home churches are groups of people who meet to talk about messages like this, but also to dig deeper into these scripture passages to understand more of who God is and who he's called his people, us, to be. In James uh, chapter 5, 13 to 18 from the message, it tells us when we should pray. Are you hurting? Pray. Do you feel great? Sing. Are you sick? Call the church leaders together to pray and anoint you with oil in the name of the master. Believing prayer will heal you and Jesus will put you on your feet. And if you've sinned, you'll be forgiven, healed, inside and out. Make this your common practice. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you can live together whole and healed. The prayer of a person living right with God is something powerful to be reckoned with Elijah, for instance, human, just like us, prayed hard that it wouldn't rain. Pr then, and then, and it didn't, not a drop for three and a half years. Then he prayed that it would rain, and it did. The showers came, and everything 
started growing again. Why did prayer work? Why was the work of Elijah successful? Why was there power in that prayer? Elijah prayed when God wanted to, when God asked him to. He waited for God to speak. We've got tons of stories in the Bible of people that are waiting. Queen Esther, we can read about her. She was an Israelite who asked all the people to fast and pray with her before she went before her husband, the king, to save them. They waited. They waited on God, and he acted. Daniel. Daniel prayed to God even in the face of death. Israel and Egypt waiting together in their homes during the Passover is the beginning of them praying together as families for redemption. You can think, too, of the paraplegic who was led in through the roof of the building where Jesus was teaching. He was saved by faithful prayers, but not his own. The faith and prayers of his friends were what Jesus saw and reached out to. We need to wait for God. When we start to actually listen, then we can pitch in and God's power will be revealed. It's so easy to get lost. The disciples got lost as soon as Jesus came back. He was right before them and they forgot three years of teaching and they were right back to their roots. He's going to be the king with a sword. We're going to take over the world and bless it with a sword. It's just, it sounds silly, but it's so easy to get lost. And then he ascended and they're stuck looking at him, just being amazed that he's gone to heaven. They have to be reminded again to go do what he told them to do to pray, and to wait. That spirit is going to come, but that spirit has been working throughout history. That's what we read about all these other people that were praying and waiting for the spirit to act. Don't forget the secret weapon. I'm going to invite you to turn to Luke 11, if you have your uh, Bibles there. It's a little bit ahead of Acts, a couple books, but it's written by the same author, we believe, that wrote Acts. And we're going to read 2 and 4, verse 2 and 4. It's a shorter version of the Lord's Prayer. I'm going to read it once, but then I'm going to ask us to read it together as a prayer. Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Would you read it with me? Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us, and lead us not into temptation. Amen. So one of the things that the church is called to is prayer. Waiting, waiting for God to speak. This prayer and this waiting that we have in Acts is very important. I think it's key for us as a church. Often, I mean, in my own life and experience, I don't know about yours, but when I started to pray, it was like a list for me. I mean, maybe that's just the easiest way that my mind could think of it. It was like, here's my things to do. It's so much more than that. And here we have it. Wait for God to come and God to move. That is the purpose and the place of prayer but not just for us as individuals, but for us as a body. We're not praying for you know, just our individual bread, but the bread that will sustain us. We're not, I'm not praying just for the sins 
that I have committed. I'm praying for the sins that we together have committed. If you wonder, what does that mean? Think about living in a country like Canada. We know now that colonialism was a grave sin and many people were, like a, a whole people group that were living here were just cast out and othered. That was not the way of Christ and we're part of an organization that caused that sort of sin, a group of people. That's what group sin can look like. There's no big aha. We have a couple times of prayer that are available uh, just during this uh, series, Monday nights online uh, from 8 to 8.30, and uh, as well Thursday mornings from 8.30 until 9 in the morning. Uh, if those times don't work uh, for you, you don't need to be like hold in to those, but those are just some times for us to try to anchor. Maybe you can set a reminder in your calendar and just be aware that we have a body of people that are going to be praying and listening to scripture and doing some practices to listen to God together as a body for our church. So you can join us in that. Um, but if you have other ideas about how we could pray together, or if those times don't work for you, maybe in the future we can find times to pray in meaningful ways together. But uh, that kind of is the start for this point. In order for us to hear God's voice, to know who we are called to be as a body, how we are to serve as hands and feet, we need to wait and pray together. <laughs>